So and to most of you in this audience, I think the fact that you're all here uh, so promptly shows that Ray Shepard really doesn't need much introduction as a member of the Lincoln and First Parish communities. He's known for his wisdom, for the gentle yet firm hand that made him such a superb leader of the First Parish deacons for a number of years, uh, and especially for the understated eloquence of his voice, the voice that he raises in speech and writing uh, in compelling calls to conscience on issues of justice and fairness in our society. If you haven't already done so, I really urge you to visit Ray's webpage. I've visited it several times and I don't tire of it. It's terrific, um, which introduces him and tells his story much more fully than I am going to do here or than I could do. Um, many of us know uh, that Ray is a one-time middle school history teacher turned school textbook editor, and then lately reborn as what he calls a self-appointed historiographer for young and young adult readers of the African-American experience. By now, many of you will have read his award-winning Now or Never, 54th Massachusetts Infantry's War to End Slavery, uh, and more recently, Runaway, The Daring Escape of Ona Judge, published just this year uh, for, um, for young readers, for very young readers, a, a beautiful poetic uh, picture book. And, um, and also not just published, but has been the focus of a number of recent readings readings, public readings, one of which, another with, of which is going to take place during uh, the Time for All Ages at this Sunday's worship service at First Parish. Ray's authorship of um, what he calls Black biographies that matter to all young readers, that's the language that appears on his web page, uh, has earned him broad recognition and several distinctions. Uh, this morning, Ray shared with us the news that he has been appointed as the town of Lincoln's representative on the commission charged with organizing uh, the Commonwealth's 250th anniversary celebration. Congratulations, Ray. A wonderful choice. Uh, so much for fame, however, uh, on the side of notoriety. Just this week, many of you will have noticed that uh, Ray's writings on Ona Judge have gotten him a place on the list of books banned by the Texas legislature uh, in its attempt to keep uh, material about the history of the institution of slavery. Uh, from being introduced in Texas classrooms. I'll leave it to you to decide which of these is the greater distinction. Um, <laughs> so tonight, uh, tonight's session will open with Ray's thoughts on talking about race in a time of pushback against the mode of thinking about history and the law through the prism of race that is popularly known as critical race theory. Uh, we can talk about uh, definitions later, uh, but now let's hear from Ray. After his remarks, we will invite questions and responses uh, about the talk. And we hope that we will get into a discussion of Ray's writings, which include a forthcoming book, uh, to be titled Long Time Coming, which includes another version of the story of Ona Judge for uh, young adult readers, along with biographies of celebrated African-Americans, I believe, including Harriet Tubman. Is that right, Ray? Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, you'll tell us more about it. But anyway, thank you so much for agreeing to speak to us and share your thoughts with us. We really look forward eagerly to hearing you. Thank you, Mary. What I'm gonna do is combine both my writings and my talk on, on critical race theory, that is how to respond to it. I'm gonna combine it into one sort of um, presentation. Let me begin with a lyrical view or a, 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 lyrical, a lyrical view of the question before us today. Think if you were sitting down with your grandchildren, how would you answer these questions? Did you ever wonder why there were the unfreed in the land of the free? Why 750,000 soldiers, white, black, Union, Confederate, died to keep or free the unfreed? Why a decade later, the freed were once again unfreed? Why a century later, civil rights civilians, black, white, Southerners, Northerners died freeing the unfreed once again? Or wonder why we separate perpetuate, hyphenate some Americans as if the hyphen means more or less American. That is a lyrical way to get to tonight's question. And I thank you, Mary and your committee for the opportunity to be here. I often, and very seldom do I speak about race uh, outside the context of my own writing. Um, and what and I primarily do that because I don't want to be known in First Parish or in the town of Lincoln as a, an expert on race. And I am very grateful that no one has ever asked me at, in, at First Parish to play that role. Though tonight I'm going to speak mostly outside, um, outside of my writings. And that's because as someone who was born 75 years after the end of slavery, and for those of you who are in your 70s, you can think back, that's not that long ago. That is in so many ways a lifetime and so my summer spent in the town of Sedalia, Missouri, where my parents were born, uh, spent with, I spent summers with my grandmother, was still a town of, of a neighborhood of people who knew slavery firsthand. My own grandfather, maternal grandfather, was enslaved in Missouri until he was six years old and freed or emancipated by the Missouri State uh, Emancipation in, in 1865, two years after Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. My parents grew up in, in, Jim, in the world of Jim Crow, which is of course no more than a close relative of slavery. They went to segregated schools. They used hand-me-down books that were uh, from the white schools that were cut and sometimes the N word uh, written on many of the pages. They're, they're, uh, where they lived and where we lived at, um, was color-coded. The jobs my father could find and have was definitely color-coded. And the civil rights movement did not begin until I was in high school. So I, I speak tonight then as someone who has seen this critical race theory pushback, this game plan. I've seen it before. 
it has a it has a peculiar smell and i recognize it and so tonight let me try to share a few things thoughts with you first of all let's start with a definition a critical race theory and these are right off the web so there's no originality here um, Dr. Kimberly uh, Williams Crenshaw of the, at UCLA characterizes it, one of the first users of it, characterizes it as the stark racial disparities that have persisted. That's how she explained it. Or a law professor at the University of Hawaii said it, the problem is not bad people, it is a problem. The problem is a system that produces bad outcomes. It is both humane and in, it is both humane and inclusive, inclusive to say, we have done things that have hurt all of us and we need to find a way out. And for those of you who want more evidence of how race and its the role of slavery jim crow has affected life today here's two statistics i want to share with you one from massachusetts uh, the incarceration rate whites it is um 82 out of every 100,000. For Blacks, it is 655 for every 100,000. Nationwide, in terms of the Black-White wealth gap, the last statistics available from the Brookings Institute, 1916, 19, um, 2016, um, shows white wealth on an average countrywide at $171,000, black wealth minus $17,000. Those are examples of why many people are arguing or suggest, are looking at it, critical race theory as a way to understand the, the structure, the structural impediments that prevent black and other groups achievements. Uh, think of this, in Massachusetts, blacks are 12% of the population, nowhere near that number in our towns, in our schools, in our churches, in our offices, not just Lincoln, but statewide. What is it that prevents achievement, progress. And so the work that you're doing with the racial justice here in Lincoln and First Parish is important work. It's critical work. And I hope by my few minutes here, I can be of some support to you. The pushback though is here's the, there can be a theory and people can disagree with the theory and argue against, against or for or against it, looking at facts, looking people of goodwill, sitting down together, having a critical discussion. But the pushback we're, 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 we're seeing, the pushback that's getting publicity, come, or there, it's called, well, it's divisive. It's indoctrination. It leads, it leaves children, it leads children to love America less. It presents the United States as a racist country. Earlier this month in Central York County School District in, that's in Pennsylvania, prohibited the work of Jacqueline Woodson who was a amb national ambassador for children's writing, 
restricted the work, uh, prevented the work, works of Ibram Kindi, who is a professor at the University of uh, Boston University, and James Baldwin, a writer who's had a tremendous influence on my life and my desire to try to become a writer. It also banned books by about Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. Texas school bill, um, Senate Bill 3, which goes into effect at the end of the month, end, uh, sorry, end of November, it's called, I, with a, I, perhaps it's a, their idea of irony, it's called the critical race theory bill. And in Texas classrooms, it erases from teaching the writings of Frederick Douglass, the Indian Remo Removal Act, the 15th Amendment, for those of you who don't recall, that's the amendment that gave black men the right to vote, the 1965 Voting Rights Bill, which was signed by President Lyndon B. Johnson, who was at one point early in his career, a Texas school teacher, and on a judge who escaped from Martha Washington so that she could learn to read the Bible. Those works, books about those subjects are not allowed in the Texas school system as of December. And this week, a private school in Concord, Mass, withdrew the invitation of a Pulitzer Prize winning author, Nicole Hannah-Jones, whose, whose 1619 uh, project re-examines the beginnings of slavery in the United States. They withdrew it because the noise associated with having Nicole as a speaker would take away from the overall experience. Now stop and think. These schools are educating the citizens of tomorrow. I'm sure the private school and academy and Concord will be turning out future lawyers, legislators, corporate executives who will have a cherry picked understanding of American history and will be unable to fathom why there is such a just why there is a wealth gap, an educational gap, a prison gap between the races. Let's take a brief or quick historical tour of what I call noise. When a group of ex-slaves, I'm sorry, a group of slaves here in Massachusetts petitioned the general court in 1773, 1774, and 1775. They petitioned to be freed. It was at a time when white colonists were saying, we will go to war to stop Britain from enslaving us, yet had no problem in enslaving 5,000 Blacks in the colony. When Frederick Douglass spoke out against slavery, his noise was criticized that he couldn't possibly have been a slave because he wrote and spoke too well. Douglass responded by writing his first autobiography and it was necessary for him to put on the cover written by himself. And then he had to flee to England to make sure to make more noise because his owners would know where to find him and to capture him and re-enslave him. 
When Massachusetts Governor John Andrews authorized the first black Civil War regiment, he offered the, he offered the troops the same pay as white soldiers, but Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's War Department denied such equality because, uh, it, because white soldiers would protest. The men of the 54th made their noise as they fought and died to defend the Union for 18 months without pay. Ida B. Wells made a lot of noise by writing about Jim Crow lynching at the turn of the at, at 19, at, at, in the turn of the 20th century. And for that, her newspaper office was destroyed. And unaware that the author was a woman, the civic leaders of Memphis threatened to castrate her. When Martin Luther King marched for civil rights, he was told his noise was too loud. He grew louder and called for a poor people's campaign as the best way to end racial and economic segregation. What many people don't hear or ignore when they criticize critical race theory is the positive story that it tells. Let me paraphrase, borrow from John Lewis and say, some of this noise is good noise. It's an attempt to perfect the union. It's a, an attempt, it's a push to go beyond the founders' dreams. The story lost in this echo chamber of noise is the slow, painful steps of progress towards social justice. But that's a story worth telling. That's a story that's not heard by those who would shout division, indoctrination, who would cherry pick American history. There's, this is a story of our country's refusal to surrender, to lose, to give up on its aspirations of a country and an idea that is so appealing that everyone wants to be part of it. It's why Ona Judge ran away. It's why Harriet Tubman tucked a pistol in her skirt and returned to Maryland to free family members. It's why Rosa Parks kept on sitting, no matter how loud the bus driver shouted. It's why you, this committee, are here doing this critical work. The idea, the idea of America is bigger than Thomas Jefferson or John Adams. It is such, it is so appealing that an Afghan, Afghan soccer player would grab hold of uh, landing gear on a roaring jet as it left Kabul and tumble to his death. It is so appealing that Haitians and immigrants from Latin America are aligning at the border wanting to be for the same reasons for the same reasons that Norwegians were here, came, for the Irish came, the Italians came. And yet the opponents of critical race theory refuse to see this positive story, refuse to see the story of how um, this slow, painful, but always moving forward progress towards equality and social justice. They choose to ignore it because they don't know it or because it conflicts with their self-interest or it tears at their self-image so that 
the idea of taking down a statue of Robert E. Lee in, um, in Virginia compels a person to kill in order to, so that the statue can remain. That is what we're up, that's what, what we're up against. It's a story that brings thousands, so it brings thousands here that I've said. It is a story that is worth celebrating, not a story that should be erased from the school curriculum. It's not a story, it's the story of how and who, who will make up the we and we the people. Well, as I said, I'm not I'm often uneasy speaking about anything outside of um, my own writing. And so let me run to my safe place and talk about the writing. I want to, what's important for me is in telling these stories, as, as Mary mentioned, I, I pride myself on saying, I will write stories that will, that every reader, regardless of ethnicity, gender, every reader will identify with the main character. That's my goal. And I will write it in such a way that it is age appropriate. For those of you, I understand some of you have read and never caught uh, Erica Dunbar's uh, book on Own a Judge. And if you have, I would prefer I refer you to pay, I won't read it, I'll refer you to page 97 where she talks about Ona and uh, Eliza's new husband and Ona's, Ona's reaction and the situation. Um, here's how it's presented. I present it in, 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 the, in the book for young, for primary children. And then I'm gonna read example of how I present it for young adults. Didn't you know you belong to the lady like her favorite chair or a pair of silk stockings? She was getting old, wanted to keep you in the family, give you to, she gave you to her granddaughter, Eliza. Eliza, the girl you played with when you were 10 and she was seven, now a mean and sassy woman, but she would keep you in fine dresses, fancy bonnets, soft shoes, let you rock her babies to sleep. Why'd you run on a judge? Here it is for 12 year olds. Same situation, decision on to run or stay. For Ona, thought to be 22, being first made had lost its shine. Her mother and brother dead and gone. It was time to reckon with what she had known since her separation day. She would work the rest of her life without pay never allowed to live by her wits, do what she wanted or go where she wanted. Pretty dresses held no charm, nor being the great lady's pet, nor feeling special, a, a, like a special slave. Ona could no longer delude herself that she was a member of the famous family. Granddaughter Eliza shocked President and Mar Lady Washington, when she announced she would marry a man 20 years her senior, husband-to-be Thomas Law had returned from India, white as a snowy day with two brown children, but not their mother or a wife. The way he looked at Ona made her blush and jealousy flashed in Eliza's eyes. Those are two, two examples of how you tell the same story for two different age groups, always with the same purpose. You want the reader to identify with the main character. 
You want the reader to identify with the problem. You want the reader to root for the, for the main character to solve that problem, to be successful, to run away. You want the reader to think of themselves as Ona. Um, there's a book that I recommend for everyone and it's called How the World is pa Word is Passed. Um, Clint Smith is the author. He was here last Friday at the, at the uh, Concord Book Festival. It's a marvelous book and it's, it tells how public display, how we publicly display slavery um, in, in, in a number of different locations. And in the book, he quotes the Dolson who uh, down at Mon Monticello, uh, Jefferson's plantation. And this Dolson tells Clint, he says, after years of being uh, a guide there, he says, I've come to realize that there is a difference between history and nostalgia. That history is the story of the past using all the available facts and that nostalgia is a fantasy about the past. Critical race theory, factual based, pushback, nostalgia. Let me close with, I know many of you have um, watched the, the movie Harriet. So here's how, here's how I begin the Harriet story in a book that I finished this summer. And Lord willing, I hope to be here when it's published in 2023. But here's how I begin the story. And I know all of you, many of you are familiar with the story of Harriet Tubman. But again, the purpose, my purpose, is to tell it for 12 year olds in a way that makes them identify with the character, understand the problems, root for the character, root for her success. Young Master Brodus added a slave child to his poultry property as if a nanny goat or piglet had dropped on the barnyard ground. As was the practice of the day, Armida Minty Ross's birthday was not recorded, but the wife, wise folks of Peter Neck's district along Maryland's Eastern shore best remember it before planting time, planting time in 1822, give or take a year or two. By the age of three or four, Minty watched her parents twist in terror or sorrow their 16-year-old Mariah sold to slave traders. How soon they wondered, how soon wondered, wondered Brit, Brit and Ben before their child Harriet would be sold to fatten Master Brodus's skinny. Minty's family again torn apart in a different way, yet the pain the same. Her parents had different masters. Anthony Thomas owned Ben. His stepson, Ed Brodus, owned Brit. That's Harriet's mother. Brodus turned 21, a legal age to claim what was his, rent, writ, and Minty and other children. A year later, Brodus and his wife moved to a rundown farm 10 miles up the lane and took Harriet's mother and all the children leaving her father to beg for a family visit. On her fifth and sixth planting season, many was rented to farmers living by, to a farmers living by a freshwater swamp. At night, she cried herself to sleep in a box on the kitchen floor. Winter day, she spent tending muskrat traps the musky pelts brought coins to the farmer and his wife and meat to their meager table. They sent barefoot minty into the cold, creepy bogs and no more clothes than her rough cotton smock 
to set the deadly trap. Soon sick and measles spotted, spotted, Minty pleaded with the farmer's wife, who chose to hear a whining lazy slave and sent Minty to the swamp until this feverish child collapsed, collapsed and returned and was returned with a money back demand. Now a child of seven or eight rented once again to clean house during the day, rocked a colic baby through the night. Mincy struggled to stay awake, failed to keep the baby content, crying woke Miss Susan who thrashed Minty about the neck and back and stained her body and soul with squaring, searing whelps. One night Miss Susan and argued with her husband. Minty helped herself to a lump of sugar, rawhide whip in hand. The mistress chased the sugar thief. Minty hid in the neighbor's pigsty, wondered if in her haste to taste the sugary sweet would be worth the days of hunger and the whipping sure to come. Why, a question Minty must have pondered hiding among the pigs? How does a pen, penniless child fly from slavery's cage? Again, I wanna thank you and particularly uh, for, uh, thank you for being here. And particularly, I wanna thank the, the first Paris Justice, Social Justice Committee uh, for the fine work, that, the critical work that you're doing. Mary, back to you. Here we are. Ray, Oof, I'm very moved. I'm sure many of us are uh, speechless with, with um, the emotion that you have packed into those evocations of the uh, feelings and thought processes of uh, Ona Judge and Harriet Tubman. One of the things that I find most moving about your writing is, uh, and I found it very interesting today, just, uh, and, and this is, I, I will then be quiet and call for other questions, but I noticed that one source uh, talking about academics who object to critical race theory, one of their objections is uh, that the movement, the academic and activist movement for social justice relies too much on storytelling. It relies too much on storytelling. And I think what your work demonstrates is the incredible power of storytelling. Uh, particularly in the case of, of the African American experience, where I mean there are there are documents, there are facts, there's a lot of research into what actually happened physically and uh, economically and uh, socially to uh, enslaved people, but there is so much we don't know. There's so much we don't know, and so. Uh, Storytelling is, I, I wonder if you would reflect on this. It seems to me it's fundamentally uh, also an act of imagination uh, in which the writer puts him or herself in the place uh, of a historical figure whom we can only know uh, in part and uh, recreates. Uh, what it might have felt like, what you might have thought, what you might have done. Well, thank you, Mary. I write nonfiction. Everything I say is historic. Everything I write about is historically based. It's, yes. confirmed, it's confirmed by by real facts, not false facts, not alternative facts. When I talk about in the Runaway, when I talk about her bushy black hair. That's directly from the one ads that the one ad that George Washington read. 
ran in the um, in the local newspaper in Philadelphia. When I talk about Harriet Tubman and um, and the and the pigsty, those are from her Totu biography. And the reason why, so you you tell stories because. we his story or her story we are we are storytellers we all of us are storytellers and it's a way it's a way in which we communicate and the fact that kids there are many adults and i suspect some here on this screen who had limited reading experience um in, in, in schools of, uh, of, of block topics, for lack of a better word. And, and that's because that was a culture that was canceled um, in, 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 in our lifetime. I didn't read a black author in school. No, I was out of school when I read, when I was in the army, when I discovered James Baldwin. I didn't have study a black author until I was a graduate student when we did studied Invisible Man. And so what I try to do, and I've gone on too long here. So what I'm trying to do is to, and you, you hear this all the time. I didn't know George Washington had slaves. That was just said to me recently. Or I never heard of the Tulsa massacre or this or that or whatever. And so the, my, my purpose then is to I write for my children's, my grandchildren's generation. That's, this is my legacy. I, I won't leave them a large trust fund. I'll leave them a bunch of old books and maybe they'll read it. But they will, it will be, a, they're in it. They will find stories about it, what it was like to be black in America and believing in the dream and pushing hard to be to to be part of that story that's 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 what i attempt to do and you do it so so beautifully i i certainly didn't mean to imply that the um the act of imagining or fleshing out what it would be like to feel things was fictional. Uh, it is no, 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 nor did I understand no. it that way. Yeah, but, but, no. but, but it, it does. I mean, Martha Nussbaum, the philosopher uh, and philosopher about, about the role of literature in society, she talks about uh, the importance of literature as an engine of compassionate imagination of you know, putting yourself in the place of of other characters, which is exactly um, I, what I think you've been talking about. So I appreciate it so much. Let's hear from other um, other members of the audience. Um, Mary? Yeah. Joan? Yes. Hi, Ray, I love this talk. And I think it's clear that people did because it's one of the largest attendance we've ever had at any one of our meetings. And as I said earlier, it's because of you and because of your topic. And I majored in history and I have a master's in American history and I never had any of this history. And as I'm reading more and more and more and I'm reading a lot, it's just, it's so important to me and it's so inclusive and black history is all of our history. And that's really important to me. And one of the things I wondered is how did you come to choose Ona Jetsch? Did she come to you in some some way? Yes, um, I'm, I'm public art, public history has had a very important impact on my life. So, and maybe that's the, 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 the this, growing up in Nebraska, where, as many of you know, where I grew up, and um, there are not many, many monuments and there are no monuments to, about the black experience. So you come to Boston and I'll start with the 54 and to see the, see the statue of the, um, the Robert Gould Schwal statue on the Boston Commons across the street from the State House. And I passed, I was working, I had an office near there 
and I would pass it twice a day and I would look at the, the, the sculpt faces of the men, the soldiers. And I would say to myself, one day I'm going to write their stories. And when I was in Philadelphia visiting our daughter who was in graduate school down in, in Philadelphia, we, we went to the site of the president's house and here was the story of Ona Judge, a story that I didn't know. And it, it just struck me that it's a, it was a story that I wanted to write. And I wrote it uh, before uh, Never Caught was published, and, but it took me a long time to find the right, to find a publisher. So, um, but it was, so that's what caused it. It was a story that emotionally connected to me, a story that I wanted to tell. And I wanted to tell it because, you know, it's, it's opposite of what we understand about slavery, the way slavery is taught. Slavery is taught, it's in the field, it's hard work, it's brutal. There's a lot of whippings going on. Here is someone, and to use George Washington's one ad language. Here's someone who's nearly white, her father was white, her grandfather was white, who has the best job a slave could ever have. She's the personal maid seamstress to the first lady, they didn't call Lady Washington the first lady then, but she's the, she's the first maid of America. And she wants more. And she gives all this material wealth, comfort, if you like, up for the hard scrabble life of a fugitive in New Hampshire. She suffered for more than 50 years to be free. That's a story that I, that's a story different from what the way in, young readers understand an understanding of slavery. Thank you. Other questions? Just speak up. Uh, if there are so many people, it's going to be hard to see you. So if you I have- saw, I, I see one in the chat. I, uh, Ben's probably the expert on that. Um, no, not a question. But thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. It says, thanks, Ray, for always speaking the truth so eloquently. Will we be able to share the recording? Make sure to share cast with your audience, such a powerful book, one that every American should read. Love yeah. you, Ray. Yeah, Ray. Ray's too yeah. modest to read it, but I'm not. Yeah, okay. but, it, it, but I, she's absolutely right. Cass, Isabel Wilkerson's book, should be on everyone's must read list. Definitely, yeah. Nancy, did you have your hand up? Yeah, yes, I did. Um, Ray, I wanted to thank you for this wonderful talk. And um, as a mother uh, who's tried to influence her children, I love the idea What when you said you uh, will leave a trail of books as your legacy. I just find that um, such a beautiful and evocative uh, statement and, and fact that you're doing that. And um, just to... Um, I, I'm just so aware that the power of story, um, that there's that potential to move us um, uh, and uh, you know your, your books for children in a way that facts and, and um, you know, just straight history doesn't always do. So um, I just love that you're doing this writing and um, just, uh, you know, and grateful for it. I haven't read any of your books yet, but I plan to. So um, thanks so much. And the, my other comment is going off in a completely different direction. I was um, like uh, moved to anger when I heard that there's a, a private school in Concord that did not allow this woman to come and speak. And it makes me feel like I want us all to organize and go out and protest with signs outside the, outside the school and say, you know, this is not okay in Concord, Massachusetts in our own backyard. So thank you for sharing that bit of information too. 
It was, uh, you can find this full story in the yesterday's globe. Um, I, I assume the headmaster was under some pressure from from his board. Or, or contributors. Contributors. Yeah. So Ray, just following up on that, what really struck I read the, the article yesterday and I knowing that you were coming today, I was just quite shocked. But I hadn't connected this that the noise too loud was a theme that's mm -hmm. gone on through history. And that was very important that you said to me said said and it's very important to me that i understand that that that's just one of the things that's often said and not just not just this one particular case in concord so thank right. you so much for putting all of this in perspective thank you john looking for other hands other voices Here, i i i have a hand up <clears throat> this is sarah Nimsy. oh oh sorry Hi, Sarah. Okay, it's Sarah. Yes. Hi, Hi. how are you? Hi, how are you? Good. Um, <clears throat> Thanks for attending. Oh, gosh, it was just wonderful. I'm so glad to, uh, that I was able to be here. And I guess the thing that really struck me was when you said the country's refusal to give up on ideals mm -hmm. and you gave a positive twist. <laughs> right. Um, and I don't think I've heard anybody. And I just, I thought that to see it differently that people have such a, they, they think there's such positive that they want to be here or they want to be free. They want to live up to these ideals. And right. I just, I, I just, I thought, oh my gosh, there's a way to look at this in a positive way. I mean, aspects I understand, but that there's something, um, I don't know how long we can hold on to that these days about how wonderful we are, but I do like that, I like that, um, or it struck me when you said that. Right. Because I don't think I've ever heard that said the way you said it, and I appreciated that. I, I, thank you, Sarah. What, and again, just, I, you know, I'm not attempting to be Pollyannish um and in no. my writings and it you know I, I i i show the brutality the lynchings uh i have from things i've experienced in my own life which i don't share in the book but it is it's the aspiration and that drives people forward uh, it is a reason why all of you are here today and this so you could be, I don't know if the Red Sox are playing or the Patriots are playing or whomever. Yeah. You could be doing something else, but you're here. Um, it, it, we're, 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 we're driven, people of goodwill are driven by that aspiration that is bigger, as I said, bigger than Thomas Jefferson, for sure. You well, I thank you very, very much for I learned a lot and I appreciate it. And if people could either um, come and, and get out of their, their screens and raise their hands physically, or if you can push that little thing under reaction and raise your hand, because it's very hard to know who's raising their hand if we can't see you. Yeah, or just send oh, it Ruth, in chat. Ruth, Ruth Ann. I just wanted to, to share with you that I had read or I heard a program on NPR maybe a year or two ago where a group of people were trying to find a way to influence people. What was the most effective way to influence people to change their mind about issues like this? And the answer turned out to be, and this was like, you know, a real study where they tried different methods to change people's mind. And the only one that really worked was stories. So I think those you know, stories, mm -hmm. probably that's the reason they don't want these stories in the schools because stories are amongst the most powerful ways of getting people to put themselves in other people's places, to raise the empathy level and to really change people's mind. So I think what you're doing here, Ray, writing these stories is gonna be very powerful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ruth. 
That's beautiful, Ruth Ann. Thank you. So it, I was just reading, rereading this afternoon the um, foreword uh, written by William Still, the uh, Underground Railroad conductor who kept the Underground Railroad records. Mm -hmm. And he talks about why he is gathering the stories mm -hmm. uh, and the writings of the um, of fugitives. And so he he takes a glance back uh, in, back into history and he says you know it that uh, people of faith have needed the story of the Israelites escaping Egypt and uh, other forms of oppression and that we tell the stories of the freedom fighters uh, of 1776 of the pilgrims fleeing religious persecution and he says we need the stories. Uh, and African Americans need their stories uh, so that they can be inspired to continue. But I, what Ray is saying is that we all need these stories. We all need, uh, no matter what our ethnicity, uh, we need to hear all of the stories of people who have um, fought and risked their lives and risked absolutely everything for. Uh, to try and live out an American dream of freedom. Yeah. Um, there's something in the chat from Lynn and David Elms to everyone. Uh, in your introductory remarks, you mentioned hyphens, mm -hmm. um, punctuation. Could you exp expand on that thought? Thank you. Right. Um... You know, if you think in terms of, uh, I think it's computers, but the fault, the, the thing that you go back to all the time that everything else is measured or what everything, what, what is considered to be regular, what is considered to be normal. When we say American, but then we say Hispanic American, then we say, you know, um, Asian American. We, 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 at one point, I was a colored American, and then I was a Negro American with a small N, and then I was a Negro American with a big N, and then I was an Afro American, and then I was an African American, but never American. Think about that. Ray, this is Jenny Morris. And I How wanted are you? to go back a bit. Well, thank you. Uh, I was going back to the storytelling theme a bit with mm -hmm. the, um, you know, in a sense, all history is a telling of the story. But it, you said at one point that, you know, you relied on facts that you, mm -hmm. you know, did the research behind. So I wonder how you feel about the importance of kind of getting those first sources because in a way someone could take the same facts and tell a very different story absolutely yes absolutely yes. <laughs> yeah but do you think people it's is it more i don't know persuasive to some or more impactful if they feel that you didn't make it up well I, I'm just naturally drawn to nonfiction, and it, it has to do with limits in, in my own writing craft or ability, and plotting is one of them. One of the nice things about writing biography is plotted out for you. I don't, you know, you're born and you die, and you go through these various steps. I didn't have to make that up. What I have to do then is to say, why are these steps important? Why is this life important? But I don't have to say, and then what happened? I, right. Because I can, I, as, as I know the person's life, I know that after Montgomery, King goes here, King goes there, he experiences this. He, I know what J. Edgar Hoover was doing while he, King was doing what he was doing. So I don't have to make any of it up. And so if you're um, an insecure writer like myself, then it's, a lot of comfort. <laughs> <laughs> you 
You don't seem insecure right. at all. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. My, my wife here is shaking her head. <laughs> Ray, could you say a little more about the influence of, of James Baldwin on your writing and thinking? Okay. He, uh, so, some of us uh, spend you know, some time this summer with James Baldwin. Well, I grew up in Nebraska, as I said. I went to an experimental lab school that they had at the university had for poor children. We never had any books by black authors, though in the church, we had black authors. In fact, I think my mother took me to hear Langston Hughes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm stationed, I'm in the army. I'm stationed in Germany. This is before going to college. Um, I'm stationed in Germany um, and I spent a lot of time in the library trying to get myself ready so when I come back out of the army, I'll be able to go to university. And on the bookshelf is this book. Uh, I think it's Nobody Knows My Name. Um, and it's a full face of James Baldwin. And at that moment, those big bug eyes and this sensitive face, something I never, it was something I never experienced before, but it's almost, this sounds almost like cliche, but it was a sense that could be me. I could do this. This guy, and then I start reading, this guy speaks for me, even though he's, living in Harlem and I'm in Nebraska, this guy speaks to me. And I, Jeannie, you mentioned, you know, the power of stories um, or someone mentioned, you know, the power of stories and we're all, and so it, it was a story that, that connected for me. And, and then the irony, of course, is when he started writing his nonfiction, which is his greatest gift, he became less popular in, in his lifetime because he had given up being a novelist because the civil rights movement was so important that he, he chose to focus on nonfiction and, 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 and narrative nonfiction about what it meant. Yeah. So he was telling, he was telling my story. Ray, one of the things I really loved about your talk is that it's an aspiration that this mm -hmm. to be a more perfect union. And I think that there are some people who feel that if we talk about this, we have to feel shame and we we can't move forward and we have to hide it all. But I think to have it be such an aspiration to make make our union more perfect was really, really wonderful. And I, I don't know, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about how can we get that more positive feeling that to be inclusive makes us, like John Lewis called it, the beloved community. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it like Annie Lamott's book, Bird by Bird, Person by Person? <laughs> I just wonder how we could do it. Yeah, I, you know, in truth, I, I don't know. I, um, there, 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 are, you, I do know that I, I was writing something just the other day about the game of whack-a-mole. And, and I think that's how it is. The, you know, that something pops up and something pushes down. You get hit on the head with a hammer. That, that push, that's, that's going to continue probably another century. Think of it this way. And those of you who heard Clint Smith speak at, at, at Concord on Friday. If you think in terms of slavery in, in, the, in, in this land, you can, you can slip and argue that it wasn't the United States, but in this land, 250 years. Mm -hmm. um, think in terms of 
slavery has been over 150 years, only 75 years from my lifetime. When I touched my mother's hand, who touched her father's hand, I touched slavery. Mm -hmm. So here we are a century and a half later, and of that century and a half, a century of it was Jim Crow, which was another form of slavery. It wasn't, if you want to date something, you can go to 18, 1965, 1964. In 1961, 1962, 19, when, I, or when I was in the army, on my way to Germany, in a nuclear outfit to put missiles, shoot missiles into Moscow, I was denied service in St. Louis because they didn't serve Negroes. Uh -huh. So by 1964, the civil rights, um, the public accommodation law signed by Lyndon Johnson changed that. The voting rights uh -huh. law, which of course now is under attack, changed that. Uh -huh. So. What are we, 65 or what are we, 40 years into it? Mm -hmm. We've got a long way to go. And it's going to take a lot of, but the good news is there's more people of goodwill than there are of ill will. Right, it's Tom de Normandy and- uh, Hey Tom, how are you? How are you? I'm the, well, thank you. Good. The, uh, I find myself in, in your, your thoughts there thinking of, of uh, Amanda Gorman uh, speaking at, uh, at President Biden's uh, inaugural and how uh, we're not broken, we're unfinished. Yes. And, and I, uh, I thought that was the, 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 the turn of phrase of Biden's uh, inaugural day. Mm -hmm. and, it, uh, and it's something that I take strength in on a, on a raft of levels. Uh, uh, because I think that, that it's, I'd like to think that it's true, that, uh, that we are unfinished. Well, I don't, I don't uh, it, there's, we, we, we haven't perfected the union and we probably never will, but we're better from a social justice point of perspective. We're better than we were 40 years ago. We're better than we were 100 years ago. We're better than we were 200 years ago. And sometimes it's difficult to keep that long perspective because there are all these day-to-day -day shocking events. But it's important that we, 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 we're in a long battle. Mm -hmm. I don't even think if I could compare it to a baseball game, I don't think we're more than the third inning. Mm -hmm. We have something in the chat that from Pam and Ken Hurd that says, um, L Langston Hughes, the land that never has been yet. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. One day they'll see how beautiful I am. I am, I too am American. I am, I, I'm too, I too am America. Another mm -hmm. Lexi Hughes line. The head of the uh, Four People's Campaign now and Eddie Gloud and a bunch of historians are saying we're in the time of the third reconstruction. And that, that's a very interesting concept to me that, you know, that the, we had the first reconstruction and then we had so much backlash in the second one and then we, we lost, uh, John Lewis's voting rights bill. And now we're in the third one and I hope and pray that we can make this happen. Are you, are you in, in accord with that idea of this being a third reconstruction? Well, the, the, I don't know to be truthful. Um, I, I, if anything, we're at the point where to, th to throw an election, federal troops are going to be removed. And that, of course, was the end of the second reconstruction. A compromise was work, worked out and black votes were sacrificed, black freedom was sacrificed. I, sus 
I worry that the next election, we will see a return to something uglier than what we are now living. Oh but that's personal. That's not a, a story I will tell children. <laughs> Ray, one reason I maybe asked, people could oh sorry Mary no I I was just going to say one reason I asked about James Baldwin is one of the things I found most striking in one of the books we read this summer which was the fire next time which I think is an absolute gem uh, could have been written yesterday right I did not remember that J James Baldwin uses the expression the big lie right which of course is all over the media these days to talk about the big lie of uh, the supremacy of one race over another, of the inferiority of yeah. some races to others. Uh, and uh, he talks also in that connection of how the lie is perpetuated, that it's perpetuated by stories that I miss really that tell that story over and over again that tell the stories of heroes who are white and male and uh, have certain ethnic origins and certain uh, characteristics. And uh, he says, until we can stop lying about those stories being a universal story um, that disadvantages uh, huge swaths, uh, we will never be able to heal. So in some ways, I think about what Jenny Morris said earlier about you can take the same facts or some of the same facts and spin it different ways. You can, uh, and I, I am. Um, yes. Yeah. I yep. think that uh, in some ways, the big lie is like the song, uh, that I learned growing up about home on the range, mm -hmm. home on the range where never is heard a discouraging word and the skies are not cloudy all day. There are these cheerful stories about uh, John Wayne type heroes. Uh, nobody wants to hear any of the other stories. Uh, and so we're kind of in a battle of stories, that myth uh, versus that kind of myth versus stories that are reality-based, that are fact-based. Yeah, I would um, also just remind you of Martin Luther King's speech after the march on um, March to Selma. How long, how long will this lie last? Yeah. No lie can last forever. Yeah. For those of you who need a reminder of the type of stories that Mary was talking about. Um, go watch Grit Television. I think it's Channel 499 out of Marlboro. 24 hours of Westerns. <laughs> I, I, I happen to like shoot 'em ups, and uh, there are many nights I don't sleep. And so, the more information you want it. But I watch Westerns and all of them are examples of what you just described. You want to see, you want to see the lie carried out. You wonder, anything else go, go on in these towns except at the bar and all the women in the can can dresses? <laughs> just wonder what, what else did they, did they, why weren't they on the range? <laughs> Every scene, and, and this is the hard, cold, rural West, and <laughs> the women are scantily dressed. It is, and the Indians and the Mexicans and the Negroes are way in the margins. 24 hours a day, you can see it. So if, <laughs> next time you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, flip the channel and watch it for a few minutes. <laughs> We almost don't have to watch it because it's in our heads. You know, it's, it's uh, it was a tape that got played all the way through our growing up. Uh, it's kind of, that's what you get reminded of in uh, I Am Not 
Negro um, that this terrible video track and soundtrack of our uh, our young years, those of us who are in our 70s, um, just fed us that. I think I see Pam's hand, Pam Heard. Yeah, hi, hi, Ray. Hi, Pam, how are you? Oh, oh, I'm good. Ken and I are sitting here enjoying this so much and so delighted to see so many people on, uh, on this uh, session together. It's just really heartwarming. Um, one of the things that strikes me you know, is that it, the last few years, certainly in response to the Trump administration, is that we have been, we're in a watershed moment. You talk about the third reconstruction, but I really feel like um, one of the things that is surfacing certainly more strongly than ever for me is that this feeling that this is, that this anti-racist work is white people's work. Mm -hmm. That right. it is our time. Right. This is, this is um, you know, we watched the civil rights movement, which, mm -hmm. yes, there's a history, certainly in Lincoln, of people participating and doing what they could during the civil rights movement. But right. this, you know, I, I talk with my colleagues and I am so struck by the fact that this is our work. We've had, you know, pushback against affirmative action but I'm really conscious of how white dominant our culture is and how, um, how I feel so, it's so important for us as a, a culture to begin to see the shift in population, the needs, the wealth gap, as, as Kimberly Crenshaw also coined the term intersectional mm -hmm. yeah um this this idea that when we have opportunities right in front of us such as our discussion about about uh creating more diverse and affordable and moderate income housing that this is an opportunity for us to actually talk about well, what would it mean to have a more economically and racially and intergenerational diverse stock of housing on a rail line. So I think there are ways of having these conversations that are intersectional, whether we're talking about uh, uh, race directly, or we're talking about the effects of making, uh, of decreasing the wealth gap and ways we can do that. Um, but I do think this is our work and I, I don't think we need, we should, just as you said, you don't like to mix, you know, the meat and milk of, of your life at First Parish or in Lincoln with your writing and your professional life. I feel very similarly sometimes, but I can no longer deny the push to have these conversations with my neighbors and my friends. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to well, share you. that with you. Yeah, thank you, Pam. That's really well said and um, I much appreciated. Um, I, I would I would just say you you have a huge task in front of you, um, but I'll remain optimistic. Ray, one thing that really sort of sh shocked me. I know I've noticed that. Sorry to sound mm -hmm. sectional here. I've been horrified at the Florida and Texas laws that have been passed, but I had no idea about Senate Bill Three. Mm -hmm. And the, you have any idea of why they chose these wonderful things like Frederick Douglass and the 15th Amendment? How can you not teach that? And the voting bill of 65 and owner judge, how can you, how, how could they choose those particular things? Well, you if know, I can see, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, I can see racing Tulsa because that was white people being so bad. But then this kind of thing. So anyway, I, I was asking you, so I'd love to hear what you say. Well, you can't suppress votes and then teach the 15th Amendment. You can't suppress votes and teach uh, the, the Voting Rights Bill. And so they, they teach the 14th Amendment, they teach the 64 public accommodation because those are positive American exceptionalism. They, so 
but uh, on a judge, who knows? I mean, really, all the she just wanted to read the Bible. Give us a break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, I, 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 you know, it, you know, here's no. The answer is very simple. It's a good way to get elected or reelected. Right. I mean, follow the money. yes, my wife is saying, follow the money, and she's absolutely right. And, you know, it's, there's, there's an anxiety out there. there, there's anxiousness, and you, you hear that, you know, from the French conservative, and you hear the same phrase, uh, we will not be replaced, being shouted in Charlottesville. So, and obviously, Steve Bannon's wonderful coining of Make America Great Again captured, so brilliantly captured that anxiety that exists as a country browns, if you like. Probably people noticed in the Times today the article about ed education that had the details about um, that the bill that Joan was referencing, but it had a marvelous uh, quotation from Randy Weingarten, who's the president of the National Federation of Teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, well, let's call this out for what it is. It's fear mongering. It's yes. politically motivated fear mongering. It's very, very handy. And, and the, it, the power of it though, too, inspire fear is really extraordinary to me. And I was thinking, uh, rereading parts of, um, of Erica Armstrong Dunbar's uh, version of Ona Judge's story too. Uh, she spends a lot of time talking about how the Washingtons uh, really tried to do mind policing with Ona Judge and not, they didn't allow her or other slaves uh, to have uh, social contact when they were in Philadelphia and New York with freed uh, blacks and because they were afraid of the contagion of ideas. They were afraid, were afraid that she would get, you know, get things uh, into her head. And they had these terrible ways of punishing slaves who fraternized with freed uh, people of African descent. They would sell them, they would send them back to Virginia where they didn't have any choices. Uh, so unfortunately, it, it feels like the same old, same old. These ideas are so powerful, as Ray was saying, that you know, at all costs, try to keep them out of circulation. Very depressing. <laughs> but again, I'm gonna go back to this idea of progress. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we just can't lose sight of that. We just have to keep keep telling the story. Yeah, we just can't we can't we can't we we can't lose sight of that. And on that positive note, I mentioned the the um, private school in Concord, but last month, um, but yeah, last month I was speaking at another at another private academy in in um, in Massachusetts, and they were doing just the opposite. If, yeah. Just a coincident, the day I was speaking, the chair of the history department addressed all 400 students and faculty and said, "We will not, you know, we will not uh, do what else, what other school districts are doing. Yeah, we will we'll fully teach American history." That was the chapel. That, yeah. that was a chapel talk, required chapel talk for the 400 students. So. Terrific. So, I see Jenny. Push and shove will continue, guys. You just don't lose faith. Sorry to, to have cut you off. Um, Jenny Rankin uh, had her hand up. Um, Hi. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Ray. So Hi, Jenny. I, I How are like, you? I'm good. I'm looking forward to being with you on Sunday. Oh, oh my so, goodness. All right. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. So this may be taken away from you won't like me going away from the idea of progress, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about the idea of America not being broken, but being unfinished. And I, and I guess part of me 
I mean, it's going to sound kind of heavy and theological, mm -hmm. but I think yeah. our country was founded on a sin of slavery. And yeah. when there's a sin, you, you, you confess, right? You confess and you try to tell the truth. Right. And so I think that um, part of our work, as Pam was saying, um, is, is to look at, um, you know, I need to look at my family's Rhode Island past and see what connections are there. This week, I'm looking at First Parish in Lincoln, trying to look at the connection, if there is one, with slavery and the slave trade. I know next week, Don Hafner is going to be speaking here on Thursday. He's done tons of research. And so I guess that's, you know, it's painful to look at ourselves, but um, that's part of this too. And for a long time as a minister, you know, churches want to talk about all the heroes, you know, the abolitionists and the you know, Theodore Parker, and I preach on all that stuff. And now churches are looking at themselves and they're looking at how they were connected to the slave trade and how their endowment is from money that was, you know. So I'm sorry if that takes it away from the progress direction, but that's what I have to say, so. Right, well, <laughs> in uh, Obama's uh, inauguration speech of uh, uh, 2009, he talked about the original slavery as the original sin. Um, um, so that that idea is def you know clearly is there and, and it's, it's a historical fact. There's no question. It is a historical fact. But again, people, humans are resilient. They're 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 dynamic. The gov government is only is a reflection of the people and the reflection of its 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 aspirations, its desires, its wants. There was a time when women couldn't own property, couldn't have credit cards. Think of the change that has occurred. Mm -hmm. Think of the change for those of you who are my age, women who are my age, think of your father and your grandfather's attitude towards uh, uh, towards women and gender equity. We change and we can never lose sight of that change. And here's what I would say, Jenny, when you say, look at your past, look at, you, we're not, you're not responsible for something that happened a hundred years ago. You have no ownership in it. Yes, you may benefit from it. You can acknowledge that benefit, but it's not on you. And so that's, again, that, that's, call me Pollyanna, Anish, but that's, that's what gets me through the day. That's what keeps me sane. And I'm a lot. No, Gray. Oh, <laughs> I'm a lot nicer when I'm when I'm singing. <laughs> Gray, you know, I saw the uh, the tree in the old uh, old South Church, mm -hmm. and it just gave me a whole new feeling of looking back at our church history because what it has is a little gold brass leaf with all the uh, African Americans' names on it, and some of them were famous, like Phyllis Wheatley but there were a lot of people who were known only by their first names. And when I looked at that, I felt so emotional that, that the people then are part of us. We're now all one. So I look at looking at our history as a church, not only for the sort of the two bad things that white people did, but the wonderful opportunity to be inclusive of, of African-Americans that are part of us. And that, that was a very heart opening thing for me. I see Pam, yep. Pam, and and Ken. Well, this time it's Ken. And then Mary okay. Jo. All right, I. Uh, Hi, Ken. How are you? I'm better and better, thanks. Um, I have a question for you that I've not really been able to answer myself, um, and it has to do with a friend saying that. 
well, he or she, I won't really who, um, wanted to find another word other than race to talk about race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and great. The closest thing I have come to believe is what Isabel Wilkerson did in Cast. Absolutely. But I would be, I would love to hear your suggestions if you have other thoughts or if you've thought about it. Oh, I've thought about it, and it is de definitely Cast. Mm -hmm. Think you know, think about it. Mm -hmm. How do you? Uh, what are her seven or eight principles? Mm -hmm. How do you, you? You know, how do you dehumanize? Mm -hmm. How do you? How how do you subjugate? Subjugate. It's it's a way, and in some ways, it's it's a, it's certainly a better way because the race, it, the topic, race can be so explosive, and as a you know, so why Obama tried to, in his campaigns, tried never to talk about race in his first campaign is because their, their poll numbers showed white people were, would, were totally uncomfortable with that, with the phrase. And he, he tried hard to avoid it until, of course, uh, you weren't born here, you're a secret Muslim, until that raised its head. But caste, yeah, and and the, and 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 Reverend Wright raised raised the issue of race, but caste is a way to say, if I have power, how do I how do I maintain power? And if I had knew how to use the computer, I could call call up those those seven or eight uh, attributes that she she stresses the points that she stresses. But how do you how do you control? How do you subject? You 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 control marriage, you control spouse uh, who you can marry, where you can live, how your participation in who governs you, where you can work. It's all a way to dehumanize. Mm -hmm. so cast cast I think by far is the best example. Mm -hmm. Mary Jo has a, has a question here. So I'm just, um, I just am getting a little back to James Baldwin and how much I appreciate his writing. Um, and one of the things that I got out, I think it, it was the fire next time. Mm -hmm. He was like, I'm just not going to buy into racism. I mean, I think he viewed racism as, as a white issue. Like we're really the ones that created it. And it was just like a refreshing way to look at it. You know, he said, there's one line that he said, when white people learn to love themselves, we'll be over this. And that was very powerful uh, to me. And, um, you know, I just, I do think this is going to take a long time but I do think it is a lot of the people who have been bene benefited from the legacy of slavery to examine themselves. What are we going to do about it? To kind of get back to what Pam was saying. So, you know, I think we're, I don't know, we're at kind of some sort of tipping point. So I, I really appreciated this um, gathering tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you. And one of the terms, and I don't know if you've noticed it, but in my books or in my presentations, I never use the term racist or racism. Yeah. Because I think they're too loaded. They're too they, loaded. Cut off, they, they cut off, they cut off discussion thinking. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the things uh, uh, someone, I think Jenny or, or, or Mary mentioned, and that is that Don is speaking next week, and I want to tell you how uh, how much I'm looking forward to hearing him. So. Yes, we are. Ken or Pam, do you is your hand up again, or is it up still? No, I'll put it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just wondered if you had something to add. Yes, we do want to invite you. We want to invite everyone also to a wonderful worship service on Sunday. Jenny is going to preach about related subjects. We're going to have a reading by Ray of Runaway and next 
uh, Thursday, we, well, Saturday, we are going to the African American History Museum on Beacon Hill. And next Thursday, we're going to hear from Don Hafner about the entangled lives of black and white residents of Lincoln in the 18th century. So we really have an intellectual and uh, uh, a thoughtful feast for, for all of us. And we do appreciate your being here. We appreciate Ben Wells uh, for being our technical guru tonight. Thank you, Ben. And, and Ray, wow. Uh, I don't wanna close it off if others would like to um, add things. Is there anybody who hasn't had a chance to speak who would like to, to put in some words, not necessarily last ones? No need to cut it off artificially. But. Ruth Ann had her hand up and Margaret has a uh, chat. Good. So I just wanted to say that one of the things that has given me hope for the future is, um, is the television ads. And that may sound silly, no, but no. when you talk about the power of story, when I was a, a teenager, you never saw right. blackface on television ever. No, right. no, no news people, nobody in the ads, mm -hmm. no brides in the bride magazines, none of them were ever black. And you're beginning to see that now there's a lot of black people. They're mostly all white. They're all middle class and half of them are married to white people. But you do see a lot of blacks on television and you're starting to see a lot of um, programs that have black people as the stars. Right. And that's yeah. and it's even show starting now to show up big time in the movies where you have a lot of black heroes starting. So I think that's a kind of a story that can really have a lot of power. I think uh, one of the things that helped the the movement for gay people was there were stories, movies of like um, what uh, what was the name of that one? Oh, I can't remember the name. Anyway, movies about gay people that made them appear like normal people that allowed the mainstream to start accepting them as just people yeah. and, and love them the way they are. And I think that this is very positive as we get more and more black faces yeah. in front of us. You know, and that's that, again, just more signs of the, the, the change that is going on. Uh, when I'm probably older than you, but in my day, it was the characters were, you had Rochester, you had Stephen Fetchett, you had Amos and Andy, you had Birmingham. For those of you who watched Charlie Chan, and I always wondered, it's interesting, these two names, I'm way off course. Jack Benny, Rochester. Was that because Frederick Douglass was from Rochester? Think about that. For those of you who watched uh, Little Rascals or Our Gang, there was one character called Buckwheat. George Washington grew Buckwheat. Hmm. Charlie Chan, Birmingham. Birmingham, Alabama, one wonders. I don't know if any of that's true, but that's how my mind works. Don Hafner okay. has his hand up. Hey, Don. Hi, Ray. I just wanted to say it's really been terrific. Uh, your broad range of wisdom on these topics is really stunning, and you're going to be a tough act to follow. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm eager to learn what <laughs> about your topic because... I want to set my, you've inspired me to set my next book at, in the Revolutionary War era. So I am looking forward to, to your talk. Excellent. Thank you. Fantastic. And Margaret. I just got the um, copies of Ray's book, Runaway, The Daring Escape of Ona Judge will be for sale at um, after the worship service on Sunday, we have some extra copies that you can find there. Also, Ray, to your point of moving things forward, I wanna say um, from my perspective as a parent, um, listening to um, my daughter and her friends, conversations that we have as an educator, 
uh, you know, very involved with children and whatnot. Um, I have tremendous hope for this country. I think we're in a very uh, dark and unstable time right now. I don't think um, the immediate future feels very comfortable to me, but when I hear um, the conversations of the young people, I am very encouraged. They are incredibly aware and informed and um, it, it just gives me a lot of hope for the longer term. Yeah, I, I agree. I see it in our, our grandchildren. Yeah. Again, I want to thank everyone. We thank you. Let's thank you. say thank you to Ray. Absolutely a wonderful highlight of our this fall. So thank you. Thank you so much. So generous of you. Ray is in really high demand in this area. Some of you heard him at the Concord Book Festival. And uh, so we are very privileged to have had this special time with you. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone. <laughs>